and welcome to Deeply Rooted. I'm your host, Robin Norgren, and here I offer you vignettes for you to think throughout your day, even into several days, um, with the sole purpose of tapping into our existence as spiritual beings trying to live our human experiences more fully. Thank you so much for stopping by. And um, hope you enjoy this segment. Today's prayer. May your journey be filled with peace. May your journey be filled with peace. May my journey be filled with peace. May our journey be filled with peace. Pema Chodram says, The question then is not only how to uncover our fundamental tenderness and warmth, but also how to abide there with the fragile, often bittersweet vulnerability how can we re, how can we relax and open to the uncertainty of it many of us spread a large portion of our sleep of our lives being told not to take our heart put our heart on our sleeves we're told to build up a tough skin buck up suck it up You are too sensitive. But notice the ones around you who seem at peace in their lives no matter what is going on. What things do you notice? Do they have tough skins? Do they act like they've been bucked up? Are they sucking it up? Are they being less sensitive? These are my thoughts for today. Today's activity from the book, The Art of Noticing by Rob Walker. 131 Ways to Spark Creativity, Find Inspiration, and Discover Joy in the Everyday is called Look Repeatedly. In an essay in the New York Times, culture reporter Randy Kennedy described a decade or so of going to look again and again at Caravaggio's The Denial of St. Peter at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Over the years, his view of the work evolved. He used to think Peter was its primary focus, but has come to regard another figure, the maid, who has called him out, per the Gospels, as a follower of Jesus, as the work's truly central subject. He now believes it is her, quote, hesitation and humanity in a moment of accusation that gives the painting its power. Kennedy shrugs off the possibility that this take, that this take developed over so many years might contradict historical evidence or more official art critic interpretations. He writes, one result of looking at a painting so long that you can see it in your mind's eye is that it does in a very real sense become your own not quite the same painting that anyone else will see. This could be replicated with almost any image or object. Devote time to studying something you've seen before. You can look over and over. Until, like Kennedy, you are seeing something in a way that no one else could.
I'd like to continue going through the eight most popular art myths when it comes to drawing. And if you've been with me for a while, um, you listened to a podcast where we did a uh, practice drawing where we drew some basic um, objects such as a house, a tree, some bushes, some flowers, and then add five other things to the project that you're drawing. And at this point, we're now taking that experience and we're um, debunking, if you will, the myths that have just for so long um, swirled around the um, ideas of drawing and what it means um, in the world as far as who can draw and who can't draw. So here is myth number two. There is a right and wrong way to draw. And this is from a book called Drawing with Children and also a creative method for adult beginners by Mona Brooks. And I am so grateful for this work that she has created. So anyway, the myth is there is a right and a wrong way to draw. You will find very little agreement, even among art critics, on what is good or bad art. In art courses, one professor will grade a drawing with an A, while another will reject it. Since it really boils down to personal opinion, you might as well listen to your own inner critic and draw for yourself instead of others. Unless you want to sell your art, it's not important to consider what others may or may not like. Um, I will hold off on responding to that last statement. But what I will say is it is the hardest habit to break in a classroom of kids asking, do you like it? Do you like it? And it is a lot of reframing that I do as my career as an art teacher to say, do you like it? <laughs> Uh, I say, I like everyone's art, but it's important to me that you like what you're doing. And if you don't like it, let's talk about what we might do to make adjustments so that you will like it. Um, and I think that is just such an um, example of how in life we are somehow collectively very early on trained, whether unconsciously or subconsciously or consciously, that we must ask for approval, even on the things that we are creating with our own hand. So that is um, one of my missions, I think, when it comes to being a creativity facilitator and being an art teacher in, in particular, is to really help um, someone who's even trying to create something. It really is a man's manifestation of what you're making with the use of your hand on that day. It's a snapshot. And so just like anything that we do, it may or may not please you based on what's going on inside of you, right? Um, the other thing that I tend to notice when I create something and what I share with others is Believe it or not, when you walk away from something you've created and give it even a space of 30 minutes, your perspective will change. All of that inner critic and inner self-talk um, has a chance to be um, <laughs> diverted to something else. And you'll be amazed at how something you drew, you are almost surprised by how it looks if you give it some time to breathe. Let's go to myth number three. Drawing is simply for pleasure and has no practical use. Operating on this premise, public schools in the United States have cut art budgets first whenever money is tight. In the early 1980s, some art classes were still available, but these usually came in the form of sporadic crafts time for the very young or elective art classes for upper grade levels. As the economic crunch hit in the late 80s, the arts completely disappeared in many school districts. Interestingly, teacher training programs began to increase at the same time. The teachers and parent-teacher associations began to hire uh, those who created these programs in their districts to teach them methods, paying for their training out of their own personal budgets. 
they instinctively knew that the arts helped children succeed in other school subjects. School districts began doing studies to show that control groups of students, given art, were scoring better in reading, writing, and math at the end of the year. As Howard Gardner and other educational spe specialists began to talk about multiple intelligence theory, parents and teachers got the statistics they needed to prove their intuition had been right. Such studies convinced administrators that art programs were a necessity and not a luxury. And in the 90s, as budgets were being cut even more, School districts are using regular curriculum funding to underwrite integrated programs, combining drawing with basic academic subjects. Adults who learn to draw also tell many stories about how their lives have changed and other skills have improved in the process. Business corporations give drawing courses to middle managers to help them with their problem-solving abilities and critical thinking skills. It's interesting to note that when people accomplish something they never thought they could do, it changes their belief system. They realize they can approach other unknown areas and subjects with a more open attitude for learning. Well, I will leave those thoughts for you for today. And I would encourage you, even if it's just for a few minutes today, just to grab a pen, just to do a little bit of a doodle of something, some sort of object you might see in your pathway today. Um, and uh, just notice, notice if these thoughts uh, align with what you're experiencing in your own body. Today, I'd like to give you um, a question to ponder for yourself. Um, and I'm titling this um, a Spiritual Direction for Beginners. All of us have a history with God, whether or not we're conscious of it. Henry Nouwen says, Our history with God reflects the way we listen, read, speak, think, and pray. And although our personal story is unique, it is part of a greater story, God's story of our lives. And when we claim and share our sacred history, we bear witness to others that God has a greater story about each of us. Here's our question for today. What thoughts, what moments, excuse me, what moments in your life with God stand out as crucial in your spiritual journey. As you're thinking about this, describe these moments succinctly and indicate their main intellectual, emotional, and spiritual significance. Here's a follow-up question. When you think of the three major disciplines of the spiritual life, looking within to the heart, looking to God in the book, and looking to each other in community, where do you see your greatest gifts and your greatest need? <music>